Okay, are you ready to get started? Let's see where we're going to go. First of all, welcome. I hope you enjoy a little bit of Texas history, uh, and it'll be a little bit. This, what, what you're going to see today is used to be a six-lecture seminar that I put together and gave to several of the audio groups, Sage and Forum and some of those. And I thought, you know, there's no way I want to inflict on my friends at Westminster six hour and a half lectures. <laughs> so I, I condensed it down to two one hour lectures. And you're going to have the first of them tonight. And you can imagine that there's a whole lot of information that has got to be gone through to, to get from here to 1836. And so I am going to ask you to hold your questions until the end, because if I have to stop and talk about each slide, we're just not going to make it. So we're going to ask you to hold your questions, and I want to start off by giving, getting some feel for you all. I know most of you, but I'm going to show you a picture, an image, and I want you to quickly look at it, and if you've ever seen it before, raise your hand. <laughs> Hands up. Hands up. Maybe, maybe high. I figured that most people who grew up in Texas would recognize that. And if you are from California or New York or someplace, you probably wouldn't. So that gives me a sense that maybe we're half and half. Half of you have had a seventh grade course in Texas history. This is just a brief review of that. The other half of you might be interested since you're living here, so that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to sit down if it's okay with you. And I have to start off by telling you that I can't help it. You, you have to talk about Texas, and you have to use superlatives. Now, here's a couple of our big authors. J. Frank Doby says, Texans are the only race of people who do not depend on breeding for propagation. They can be made by breath in a big white hat. So welcome to you Californians. Take a breath and put on your white hat. John Steinbeck says Texas is a state of mind. It's an obsession. And above all, Texas is a nation in every sense of the word. Yes. Now, Noah Smith Wick was a blacksmith back in 1836. And he wrote some memoirs about that period of Texas. And there's what he said. Texas was a heaven for men and dogs, but hell for women and oxen. I think he was probably right. So we're gonna we're gonna go from the land to the first peoples to the early European contact in the first half of this lecture, and I want to start off by asking you, what is that? I heard Enchanted Rock, and that's correct. That's Enchanted Rock. It's just up on the other side of Llano. That's the oldest rock in Texas. It's about 1.3 billion years old. I say rock, I meant surface rock. All right? Surely you can get the bridge. Where's that? That's our Pennybacker Bridge. Now, what about that canyon? Santa Elena Canyon down in the Big Bend. That's correct. The thing that's common about those two pictures are those limestone cliffs. This used to be a sea a long time ago, about a hundred million years ago, and those limestone cliffs were laid down back then, and they run all the way from Big Bend to Austin and beyond. Now here's another one that might get you, what is that? Think about it for a minute. Looking down from 30,000 feet on what? About 40 miles uh, east of Plainview, it's up in the Panhandle, and those little circles are irrigation for cotton farms. That's the youngest land in Texas. It's about a half a million years old. And here's the summary. This is the age of Texas lands. You can see the Llano uplift right there in the middle. That's Enchanted Rock, 1.3 billion years old. And you can see that 100 million year line that we looked at from Santa Elena Canyon to Austin. And then up in the Panhandle, you've got 
what used to be the Rocky Mountains, and they, he rode it off of the Rockies, washed down into the Texas Panhandle. So that's that land up there. Uh, we talked about this subject here a while back, but humans came to Texas at least 20,000 years ago and probably before that. They first came along this coastal route because they couldn't get through the ice sheets. And then uh, they had what they call the ice-free corridor that melted kind of there in the middle and it let them go all the way through Canada and get down to Texas. We have uh, some of the earliest known human occupations in the Americas in Texas. The Galt site, we've made a field trip up to it. It's up by Florence about, what, 50 miles from here? And it's got human occupation at least 20,000 and probably 22,000 years ago. So that's how long people have been here. Now those first people that came here uh, were big game hunters. The mammoth were here. The, there was a great big buffalo that was here. We had our own native horse. Yes, there were saber-toothed tigers. And these guys hunted those animals with a spear thrower called an atalel. And there's a picture of him doing that. And they used some spear points that they made called Clovis and Folsom. And that lasted as long as those big animals lasted. But at the end of the Ice Age, climate changed and those animals went extinct. And then we had the archaic period. It's like 10,000 years ago to roughly 1,500 years ago. But again, the ice melted, the sea level rose. It was a milder climate. Those mammoths went extinct. And humans had to switch their hunting patterns, so they became hunter-gatherers. They hunted small game, and they gathered pecans, and picked a pair of tunas, and other things that they could eat. And there was a huge population explosion during that period of time. A lot, a lot more people showed up in Texas and everywhere. Now this is a, a picture of how they made their cooking. They would build a big hearth, they would throw rocks in it, let the rocks get hot, they could heat things up. They could even put a hot rock in a skin bag and make a, make a bag of soup. And, and the remains of those cooking things are really not uncommon in the Texas Hill Country and beyond. They're called burnt rock mittens. And there's a picture of one. That's a burnt, that's all Indian rocks that were thrown out. That's out west of here. Got some cactus in the middle. But you can find these burnt rock mittens fairly commonly in, in ranches around here. <clears throat> now, along the lower Pecos River and Seminole Canyon, down where it runs into the Rio Grande, we've got some hugely important and impressive uh, rock art. They, they painted the rocks. And there's a picture of one of them at, uh, near Seminole Canyon. And this is a close-up of my favorite portion of that. That's called the White Shaman. And there's a whole story about that particular picture. But just suffice it to say that we've got rock art all over the lower Pecos and Seminole Canyon areas, and it dates to from two to three thousand years ago, and it's some of the best rock art in the world right here in Texas. Then we get to what's called the prehistoric period. That's roughly 1,500 years ago, up until the Europeans showed up, and uh, the two or three things that changed that made that possible was we. We learned how, some of us learned how to farm. We learned how to plant corn and squash and those things. Not everybody, but some did. That means they could settle down and not have to move around. And uh, we had two huge technology improvements. We invented the bow and arrow, and that was much more efficient for hunting than was the spear. So that was big. And the other thing we learned how to do is to make ceramic pottery. And so that helped with storage containers and stuff like that. Uh, some people settled down uh, and farmed and some remained hunter-gatherers right up until and beyond the time that the Europeans showed up. And it was during this period that we really had people come together in what we now call tribes. Cultures, subcultures are different from each other and different tribes of, of Indians. Here's some of the pottery. Cattos in East Texas made the best pottery in the state. They made pottery all over Texas, but that's some Caddo pottery. It's, it's really kind of neat. And this uh, piece here uh, is Caracua, and a friend of mine and I found what 
We went out to a Caracal site down in Victoria, picked up a double handful of pot shirts and brought them back. And he was very skillful. He glued them together and that's a Caracal pot and it's in the Victoria Museum today. Now another one of my favorite places uh, is up about oh, 30 or 40 miles north of Amarillo. It's called the Alabates Flint Quarry and it was very unique in terms of the kind of flint that was there. Now flint is everywhere there's limestone. But this flint was unique because it was colored uh, very distinctively. Most flint is not and it was also very easily chipped. So it was a resource that Indians used for over 10,000 years. And they went all over to mine this flint from the Halibates Flint Quarry and, they, and traded it all over the country. There have been pieces like spearheads made of this stuff found all the way up into Montana and over to Florida in, in archaeological sites they found Halibates Flint. So the Europeans showed up. It was the Spaniards first. Uh, they showed up, uh, you know, discovered America. And uh, in 1517, they started looking around the Gulf of Mexico, hoping that they could find a southwestern passage that would let them go to China. That's real, They didn't care about Texas. They wanted, wanted to go to China. So they were looking for that passage through the Gulf, and they couldn't find it because it's not there. Uh, and in 1519, this guy Pineda made a, all, made a big circle around the Gulf and he drew this map, which is amazingly accurate, really, when you think about it, for that point in time. He's got Florida sticking down here. He's got the Yucatan Peninsula over here. That's Cuba. That's Jamaica. So he's got all that stuff done. He, he discovered the Mississippi River, talked about fresh water being 20 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico and drew some pictures. He even drew one river in Texas. We're not sure which one. It was probably the Sabine River, but we're not sure. That was 1519. And so in 1558, roughly, the Spaniards sent an expedition to Florida to see what they, they wanted looking for gold. So they sent this guy Narvaez to Florida with a big bunch of ships and people. And he left some of the people off and he abandoned them. They got lost. He left, so they were stranded in Florida. So they made some rafts in Florida and they floated all the way around the Gulf of Mexico and they landed on Galveston Island. And after about a year, all but four of them were e either died or were killed by the Indians. One of those four was this guy named Cabeza de Vaca. And he ended up, he and his four buddies walked all the way from Galveston. They stayed a while down here by Victoria, and they wandered around, and they got up uh, to the Rio Grande, and they went all the way up into northern Mexico, where they finally reconnected with the Spaniards. And De Vaca, Cabeza De Vaca, goes back to Spain, and he writes his memoirs. And that's a book that you can read about today, and it's got some really neat descriptions of his journey through Texas uh, in that eight-year period of time in the 1500s. One of the guys that was with him went back to Spain and said, they said there's gold everywhere north of where we were. There's huge cities just like in Mexico, and it's full of gold. So the Spaniards were going to find that. They sent two expeditions to try to find that gold. One of them was by Coronado. You've heard of him. He came into New Mexico, and he came up and went all the way to Kansas looking for Cuervera, didn't find the gold, went back, uh, and we know at least one place where he camped because in Bancos Canyon near Floydana, right about there, they found those artifacts that are right there. Those are horseshoe nails and they're points to crossbows, and there's no question that that Bancos Canyon right there is a Coronado campsite as he came through Texas. Now the other expedition started off with DeSoto and he died on the Mississippi and his second in command, a guy named Moscoso, in 1542 came all the way into Texas 
decided he'd never make it to Mexico that way. So he went back, went down the Mississippi, floated all the way around, and finally got back to Mexico. So those were two 1540s expeditions. In 1558, the, the Spaniards sent another expedition under this guy, Lanzaris, and he explored all the way from the Rio Grande, went that, back to Florida, and he was looking for a place to settle. They were thinking about, well, we need to start settling this, this territory. And he landed at Matagorda Bay, and he got out. And Spain had this formal act of possession that declared that the land was theirs. So he uh, performed that act at Matagorda Bay and claimed Texas and the Western United States for Spain in 1558. Now, uh, the horse had been extinct for 10,000 years. The Indians had no clue a horse was, but they had dogs, and the Apaches knew how to make this, I think it's called a trobois, it's a little sled that they could hook on a dog and he could, could pull a load, so there's a picture of an Apache and his dog with a trobois. Well, they get these horses from the Spaniards who had got kicked out of New Mexico by the Pueblo Indians, and so the Indians get the horses. The Pueblans had them first. As far as Texas goes, it was the Apaches that were the first Texans to have horses. And, and then came along the Comanches, and that was a huge deal for the Comanches. They totally built their lifestyle around horses uh, for like 150 years. They were known as the finest light cavalry in the world. And just think about it for a minute. First of all, look at that trois behind a horse. You can probably carry maybe six or eight times more load than you could with that dog. So they used the horse to pull the trobois to go from campsite to campsite. But more importantly, they had horses and they had bows and arrows. And think about how much easier it was to shoot a buffalo from your horse with your arrow than it was trying to creep up behind him without your horse and shoot him before he saw you. So the horses were a big deal uh, for, the, for the Native Americans. Now, European settlement in Texas began out of El Paso. Uh, 1659 was a mission in Juarez, and then uh, a little bit later, again, the Puebla Indians kicked the Spaniards out of Santa Fe in New Mexico, and they pushed them down to El Paso. And they found uh, a, a mission uh, in Isleta, which is now in, in Texas. So that's kind of the first mission in Texas. And the Indians who lived in West Texas along the Concho River, they went up to El Paso and they said, you know what, we would really like to have a mission on the Concho River. And so the Spaniard says, well, maybe so. So they sent this guy, Mendoza, out to check it out in 1683. He went to San Angelo and he went about 15 miles up the river from San Angelo to Gail Roach's ranch and stopped and visited with the Indians and he actually built a mission that lasted for about six months uh, on her property uh, uh, near San Angelo. And then they went back to, uh, the Spaniards went back to El Paso and about that same time another big thing happened which changed everything. And that is this French guy named LaSalle shows up. And so all of a sudden, the entire focus on settling Texas went away from San Angelo and went down to figure out what we're going to do about this Frenchman. So here he is, Rene Robert Cavier, Seur de la Salle. He was from France, of course. He was a fur trader up in Canada, went all over the Great Lakes exploring and setting up trading posts. In 1682, he and some guys got in canoes and went all the way down to the mouth of the Mississippi. And when he got down there, he claimed the watershed of the Mississippi River, which includes a little part of Texas, for France. So now France has a claim to Texas. And he went back to, to Canada, went over to, to France, uh, talked to the people over there, talked to the, the king, and decided that they wanted to start French settlement, 
16. They wanted to settle in Texas. So he comes to Texas with four ships and about 300 settlers. And he landed and started his settlement. And in 1686, his last ship wrecked in Matagorda Bay. It was named LaBelle. And it wrecked and he's stranded. So you know, he doesn't know what to do. So he's going to walk back to Canada and get help. He tried several times unsuccessfully before. So he takes off again, and he gets just about to Navasota, and some of his own men assassinate him. So that's the end of LaSalle. But several of the men that were with him went on back to Canada and got back to, to, uh, to France and wrote a book about it. So here is a map of Matagorda Bay. Uh, there's Pascabaya, where you go in from the Gulf all the way up to Vaca Bay and up Garcetas Creek is where LaSalle built his settlement, which he called Fort St. Louis. And that's an artist's rendition of what Fort St. Louis might have looked like. We have a, a pretty good idea about that. Oh, before I do that. So I took this picture from Fort St. Louis and I'm looking across Garcetas Creek and what's on the other side? A huge marsh. So you should think mosquitoes, really big ones. And that's one of several reasons why this was not a very good place to live. The uh, creek also was brackish at times because it was too close and got some tidal impact. So uh, Fort St. Louis was not the best place to live. Uh, LaSalle, uh, Spaniards found out about that pretty quickly. And it really shocked them. They recognized how vulnerable their new territory was. It was not defended. And so they decided we got to do two things. First thing we have to do is kick LaSalle out. And, uh, and so they did that. It took them 13 different voyages or expeditions to try to find the guy. Some of them were by land and some of them were by sea over a period of three three uh, years time and they finally found him we'll do that in a minute but that activity is what finally woke Spain up and made them decide for real we have got to settle Texas so when the, when the Spaniards finally found LaSalle uh, they had a guy that could draw pictures with them named Juan de Chapa and he drew these two pictures of Fort St. Louis uh, oh, by the way, I should say that they found it in April of 1689. And early that same year, there were several adults that were left. The Caranco Indians massacred all of them and uh, adopted some of the French children. So when the Spaniards got there, there's no people there, but the remains of the fort was, was there. So this is what was written on the, what carved on the door of the fort. They said we, we left France in 1684, and they were trying to carve 1689, and they didn't make it that far before the Indians got them. And this is a picture of what uh, Fort St. Louis looked like. It had a fort, had a storeroom, it had some little casitas, if you will, some little houses, and it had eight cannons. And he talks about those cannons here. So in, eight, in 1914, this famous Texas historian named Herbert Bolton was doing some research and he was uncovering all these maps and journals from the Spanish archives in both Sevilla and in Mexico City and he found a map uh, that suggested to him that Fort St. Louis was on Garcia's Creek. He was teaching here at UT so he gets on a train or I don't know how he got there but he got a train. He took a train to Victoria and he got off and he says, who owns land on Garcia's Creek? And somebody says, well, Claude Kieran does. So he finds Mr. Kieran. Kieran takes him out and uh, shows him his ranch on Garcia's Creek. And sure enough, there's evidence of, of the French settlement. So, and, the, and the later Spaniard settlement on top of that. So he finds it 
They did some excavations in 1950, which proved it again. And then uh, time passed in 1995, uh, an archeologist here at the state decided he would find Lavelle. If he knew it sank, and he knew about where. So he went out and looked and he found it. And so they built what's called a coffer dam and blocked off Matagorda Bay. The water is about 14 feet deep. They made a big circle that pumped water out and had a dry land archeological excavation in the middle of Matagorda Bay. They dug up the Lavelle, they preserved it. It's now on display down at the Texas History so if you want to see, see uh, LaBelle, you can go down there. The next year, one of the ranch hands on, Key, on the old Key Rand Ranch was wandering around with a metal detector. He gets his beep, 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 and he digs down. And he's got a great big long iron object. So he calls the authorities, and they go in, and they dug up LaSalle's cannons. So there's, there's LaSalle's cannons that was dug up in Fort St. Louis in 1996. Okay, so when when the Spaniards were down there in 89, the, some Indians from East Texas, called the Tejas Indians, where we get our state's name, they came down and they said to Alonzo de Leon, was his name, they said, look, we really would like you guys to come and build a, some, a mission up here where we live, somewhere around Nacogdoches, so to be. So Deleon says, well, I'll see. So they went back and they decided to do that. Not so much for the Indians, but so they could protect it. So they, they go all the way in 1690 and they built a mission on the Natchez River uh, in East Texas. It lasted four years. Uh, they had to keep supplying it from Mexico. Uh, it was not a good place to live. The Indians were bad. And they finally abandoned the whole thing 1693 and went back to Mexico. Oops, I've already done that one. <clears throat> okay, here's another French thorn in our side. 1713, uh, this guy comes and he, for, he forms a French trading post in what's today Natchitoches, Louisiana. It's the first settlement in Louisiana before New Orleans. He's trading up there, and the Spaniards find out about that, and they say, no, you know, this is our territory, you can't, you can't trade there. So they responded in 1716 by creating a capital of Texas called Los Adanes, 15 miles from Natchitoches, inside of Louisiana. So the first capital of Texas is today in Louisiana. And they built a presidio or a fort and four missions around Nacogdoches and St. Augustine. That was 1760. 1718, they said, man, it's a long way out there. We got to send all this stuff from Mexico. It's very expensive. So we need a halfway point to, to, to support our supply chain. And so they built one. They named it San Antonio. You know about that, so they built a mission and a fort at San Antonio as a halfway point for supplying those missions. Now, about the same point in time, they said we got to keep the French off of the coast as well. So they went down back to Matagorda Bay, and right on top of La Salle's Fort St. Louis, they built a Spanish fort, which is named La Bahia, and they built a, a, a mission just across the creek from. They had the same bad experience with both Indians and the, and the environment that the French did. So in four years, they moved that Presidio ambition to the Guadalupe River north of Victoria. And then a little later on, they moved it to Goliad, where it is today. So you see the La Bahia mission and Presidio at Goliad. That was originally down here on the bay. And uh, I had the good fortune in the 80s do some metal detecting at the Mission uh, and Presidio in Victoria, and we found a lot of artifacts. I brought a couple of them, they're kind of interesting. One of them is a really neat religious medallion. You can come up and look at that after you want. But this, this chocolate pot is a chocolate pot. It's made out of copper, and it's very special. And it was just for making the chocolate, and the priests were the only ones who used it, and they 
made the chocolate for the Indians, hot chocolate was a real delicacy. And so they could attract the Indians to come in to the mission if they offered them chocolate. So this pot cooked up some hot chocolate for some Indians in about 1740. <clears throat> okay, the same thing was going on at that mission in Victoria. It's the first ranch in Texas. They brought a bunch of cows up, they, they propagated, so all of a sudden they've got a huge ranch that's operated by the priest out of the mission. He needed some cowboys to handle those cows and who he got were his Indians. So the very first Texas cowboys were Native Americans at La Bahia. And there's a little picture of a branding. Well, you know the rest of the story. Um, after the Civil War, we had all the trail rides were trailing the Longhorns from Texas up to Dodge City and beyond, so that's where that story comes from. The Texas Longhorn is kind of interesting. He started off a, a Spanish cow called a Retinto, orange color, and they mixed it with this British Longhorn ox, and they got what we know today as a Texas Longhorn. Okay, not much time on this, just to say that in the middle 1700s, the Spaniards were building missions everywhere. And you can see the dots on the map where they built them. And by the end of the 1700s, they pretty much shut them all down because most of the Indians had either died or been assimilated. So there wasn't much need for, for them. They just had regular churches after that. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, one existed here out in Zucker Park in Austin for a few months before it moved to San Antonio, Conception Mission. One of those missions was out at San Saba, San Saba built that in 1758, it was for the Apaches and the, and the Comanches who were the lords of the Southern Plains did not like the fact that the Spaniards were siding with their arch rivals, the Apaches. And so the mission had been there a year and a huge bunch of Comanches came down out of the north and sacked the mission and killed everybody in sight and just destroyed the San Saba mission. Now, it turns out that one of the two priests had a, had a cousin who was a wealthy man in New Mexico, and that cousin had, had financed the mission. And when his, when his cousin, the priest, died, he commissioned a painting to be made of that scene, and this is it. That's the San Saba mission being attacked by the Indians. There are the two priests. That's the cousin of the guy who mission of painting. It was done in 1762. It hangs in the, in the uh, Mexican uh, National Museum in Mexico City today, and that is the first painting that depicts a historical event in the state of Texas, that became the city of Texas. Okay, time went along, and now we there's a guy named Escondon who decides he wants to colonize the lower Rio Grande Valley. And he gets permission to do that. So he takes a huge bunch of settlers, of, you know, wagon loads of people and goods and stuff. And he comes up to the Rio Grande and he forms six settlements along the lower Rio Grande. You can see them listed down here. One of them is Laredo. That's the only one that's actually in Texas. Uh, Dolores was for a while, but the rest of them, you recognize some of the names. Revilla, Reynosa. Carmago, those are all of the current towns along the lower Rio Grande. So that occurred in 1756. Now, a few years later, there was another boundary change that had some importance for Texas. There was a war called the Seven Years' War between Britain and France and some other European people. We had pieces of it going on here in the United States. And anyway, the Treaty of Paris ended that war in 1763. And so Britain and France and Spain agreed for some land changes. Florida went from Spain to Britain, so that's now British territory, uh, had been Spanish. And Louisiana was originally French, and it went to Spain. 
so now uh, Texas is right next to uh, British territory, and it's no longer a border state. And, and so it doesn't need to be defended anymore. So the Spaniards sent out this expedition to check things out. This guy, Rudy, they sent him all the way from California to Texas, checking all the northern frontier. And he concluded that there was no more need for a for border protection. So we did not need the that loss of days and all those East Texas Presidios and missions. It wasn't necessary to protect the border anymore. So they shut them all down in 1772 and made everybody who was over in East Texas go back to San Antonio. Uh, and they changed the capital from Los Adeis, where it had been since 1718, I think, 50-ish years. They moved it to San Antonio. So now the capital of Texas is in San Antonio. And some of these people who went back didn't like it. And they were finally allowed to go halfway back to East Texas and settle. And so they made it first to the Trinity River, and then in 1776 they made it back to Nacogdoches and reformed Nacogdoches as a Spanish settlement in Texas. So here's a quick look at Texas in 1800. Uh, there were four Spanish settlements, Laredo, La Bahia, or Goliad, San Antonio and Nacogdoches. That's where the Spaniards lived. Total population was about 3,000 in 1800. We have no clue how many Indians there were, but some estimates say that there had to be at least 25,000 scattered all over, but mostly up here in the north part. So really a, a strongly skewed population to Native Americans. Another thing happened in 1803. The United States buys uh, Louisiana from France. Spain had given it back to France, by the way. So now we buy it from France. And uh, got an immediate spat with uh, Spain about the border. Spain said, well, it's got to be here where we always have thought it was. That's Calcasieu River. Rio Hondo up here. Uh, that's where we always considered the border between Texas and Louisiana. But the United States says, no, nah, we bought it from France, and they claimed the Rio Grande, all the way to the Rio Grande. So America's, Americans say it's the Rio Grande. The Spaniards say, no, it's over here. And almost when they went to war, they were just about to go to war, and cooler heads prevailed among the two commanders of the two armies. They agreed that they would not fight, but instead they would create this neutral ground. They actually had it like a treaty. And so they said, all right, we're going to cut out this piece of territory right there. We're going to call that the neutral ground. That's neither one of ours. We don't know who it belongs to. So it's going to be neutral ground. And it's, it was very lawless because nobody, there was no government over it. So all the robbers and the bad people went to the neutral ground because there were no cops to look after. So we had that situation for several years uh, in the neutral ground. Now, during that same period, there were several groups of Americans who saw what they thought to be an opportunity to go grab Texas and take it away from Spain. And so they had these, there were groups of men that got together they would come out of Louisiana and march through Nacogdoches, head down to San Antonio. And there were three main ones. 1813 was a guy named Guterres, and a different guy. And they uh, had a flag, and they went to Nacogdoches, and they declared independence, and went down to Goliad, had a fight, went to San Antonio, had a fight, won those two fights. And then the Spaniards, under a general named Arundondo, with a lieutenant named Santa Ana, came back and had a huge battle west of San Antonio, by far the biggest battle that's ever taken place in Texas. And the Spanish kicked that bunch of Americans 
And they didn't, they killed most of them. They kicked the rest of them back to Louisiana. So that, that, did, that failed. In 1819, this guy James Long comes along with a group. He goes to Nacogdoches. He declared the Republic of Texas. He's got a flag. And it didn't take long, and they kicked him out as well. So that failed. There was another guy that lived in Nacogdoches, Hayden Edwards. And he says, all right, now I've got my opportunity. By this time, it's Mexico and not Spain. So he declares the Republic of Fredonia. And the Mexicans, with the help of the American settlers who were already here, went to Nacogdoches and kicked Edwards out. So we had several attempts to take Texas away from Spain, and none of them worked. Now, in 1819, finally we get this border settled. Uh, these two people from the United States and Spain uh, had a treaty, and they said, all right, we now agree on where the border is. And it, it formed the current eastern border of Texas. It eliminated, did away with the neutral ground. It said the Sabine River is the border between Texas and Louisiana. It comes up the Sabine River, goes up the Red River, and then up to the Arkansas and on up. So this part is now the current border of Texas, created in 1819. And we gave Spain $5 million for that deal. So now there's a few Spaniards at this point in time, yeah, a few Spaniards at this point in time, and a whole bunch of Indians in Texas. And so some Americans decide we need to come. It starts with this guy, Moses Austin. He's from Connecticut. He went to Virginia and founded a lead mine and became very successful at it. Had a successful lead mine in Virginia. Decided that he'd go to Spanish Missouri, which was Spanish at the time, which he did. Got him another lead mine over there, had some success, and then it failed. It was a, an economic disaster, and he, he went bankrupt. So he's looking for something else to do. So he says, well, maybe I can get permission to bring some colonists into Texas. So he goes to San Antonio, and he asks for permission to form an American colony. First he's turned down, and then a guy that later was a friend talked the governor who was in San Antonio into it. So they gave him permission for a colony in Texas. So he's heading back to Missouri to start. He got sick. He got pneumonia on the way back. He writes a quick letter to his son and said, I really want you to take over my Texas venture. And then Moses Austin died. And his son Stephen F. Austin, and same story. He ran his dad's lead mine for a while, became a Missouri legislator, wanted to be a lawyer, went to New Orleans to study law, got his father's letter, and reluctantly, he didn't want to go to Texas, so reluctantly said, okay, I'll go. And then he learned that his father had died on the trip back. So Stephen Austin, now he goes to Texas. And just about the time he gets to San Antonio, they find out that Mexico has won its independence from Spain. So the government that he's dealing with is not the same one his father did. His father dealt with Spain. He now has to deal with Mexico, who just formed themselves. They don't even have a government yet. So he's got to, to work on that. And he finally succeeds, and he gets the Mexican government to give him permission to bring in 300 families from the United States, call them the old 300. And there were some conditions, and he, he needed, Austin needed to make sure that they were of good moral character, they were hardworking, and they all were Catholics, because that was the only religion that Spain and Mexico would allow. And he got a really good deal. He got a tax-free, uh, no taxes for six years, and no taxes on imports. Of course, this was during slavery times. Mexico was getting rid of slavery at this point. But they said to Austin, all right, you can bring in 
the settlers and they can, and the adult slaves can still be slaves, but when all of their children get to be 14 years old, they're gonna be free. So they set up kind of a process that with time, supposedly, they would do away with slavery. And they gave them one heck of a deal on land. Of course, we had, you know, I don't know how many thousands of acres of land. What they were, what each settler was offered was called a deed and a labor. 4,428 acres of ranch land and 177 acres along flowing water for a farm. And they said you could either be a rancher or a farmer, and every settler said, I'm both. So, so I'll, I'll take that once again. The only thing they had to pay for it was nothing to the government. They had to give 12 and a half cents an acre to uh, Austin. A huge response. Uh, Austin goes back to Louisiana. He starts recruiting. He buys a ship, fills it up with people and goods, brings it back to the colony. And just in a short period of time, you got people already on the grasses, Colorado River. Uh, a few families, most of these are just men coming in to get established in break their families after. Uh, the grant is approved in February of 23, and by 1824, Austin had got his new capital and founded this town of San Felipe by Sealy. Uh, he starts the Texas Rangers. They were having problems with East Caracolas. Uh, he granted land titles. The Mexicans adopted a, a constitution very much like that of the United States. Only Texas was, didn't have many people, so they joined Texas and Coahuila as one state with a flag with two stars on it. And they said that it'll be two states until Texas qualifies by itself to be a separate state. And by the end of 1824, all the land along the grasses of the Colorado River had been claimed all the way up to Navasota and the Grand. So there's a huge bunch of people coming in. The Mexicans saw that and said, uh-oh, I think we might have made a mistake. So they sent this guy to ran uh, what they called a boundary commission. He, had, he went to East Texas and checked things out. He was really wanting to get a sense of the lay of the land. And he did, and he didn't like what he saw. He said, San Felipe will be the spark of the prizes of Texas. We've got to stop these Americans passed the law on April the 6th, it canceled most of the colonization contracts, and it, it stopped the immigration from the United States, shut off the immigration, and they, the tax holiday was over, so they had uh, customs houses established in, along the rivers in Appalachia and Alaska. The Texans didn't like that. They, they didn't like the taxes. They never, we still don't, but they, they didn't like the taxes. So they had an open rebellion in Hanna back in 1832. They calmed that down a little bit, so they started having these conventions where the Americans got together at San Felipe and tried to say, well, okay, what, what kind of a deal can we make with Mexico so we don't go to war? And what they asked for is open borders. Let those immigrants come on in from the United States. They said, no more taxes, stop taxing us. We want a separate state, and oh, by the way, we really wish we could have bilingual documents. It would be nice to have our deeds written in English instead of Spanish. And uh, uh, so that's what they asked for. They didn't get that right away. So in 1832, uh, all of the Mexican troops and everything got pushed out of East Texas. And <clears throat> 1833, Santa Ana says, well, and he was still a good guy to us. He said, well, okay, on several of these, I'll open back up your borders. Uh, you can have your bilingual documents. I'll stop the taxation. But I can't give you a separate statement quite yet. So Austin went back to see if he could not negotiate a better deal. And he ended up being put in jail in Mexico City for 21 months. And that was from 1833 until about 1836. 1834, Santa Ana,
changes his stripes. And this is this is his words. He, he dissolved Congress. He set up a dictatorship. He threw away state governments. He said, I threw up my cap for liberty, but soon found the folly of it. He said, a hundred years, my people will not be fit for liberty. He says, a despotism is a proper government for them. So he says, okay, they can't handle independence, so I'm going to be their dictator. That's the way it's going to be. And it was for a hundred years. Uh, that started wars. We weren't the first to revolt. The northern Mexican state of Zacatecas was the first to revolt against Santa Ana. They wanted the constitution, not a dictator. And Santa Ana sent an army to Zacatecas and brutally suppressed them, killed three or four thousand people and just pushed them down. Well, here we are up in Texas looking down and saying, hmm, that didn't look too good. Uh, and about that time, Austin was turned out of jail came back to Texas, and he'd had his belly full by then. He no longer supported staying a part of Mexico. He says, we've got to separate ourselves from Mexico. So on October the 2nd, they had this little skirmish down in Gonzales over a cannon, uh, and uh, they fought a little bit. One Mexican was killed, and uh, that's what created our come and take it cannon. Gonzalez thing. So he, uh, they go back. Goliad is occupied by, I'm going to call them Americans because these were people from Tennessee and other places that came. There weren't that many real Texans at that time. They were just young, young boys on an adventure really from Tennessee. So I'm going to call them Americans. They came to Texas. Uh, Texas did set up a provisional government. November, they named Sam Houston the commander of the army, and the, the uh, Americans went from Goliad, I'm uh, sorry, went from Gonzales to San Antonio and pushed the Mexican army out of San Antonio. So now the Americans have occupied San Antonio at the end of 1835. 1836 comes along. Santa Ana leads a huge Mexican army back. They show up in San Antonio in February. The Texan defenders in, in San Antonio uh, lock themselves up inside of the Alamo. Uh, over here in Washington on the Brazos by Brenham, we had a convention. And on March the 2nd, we declared Texas independence. On March the 6th, the Mexican army stormed the Alamo killed every one of the 185, 189 Americans who were defending the Alamo. So that's the Battle of the Alamo. Uh, a few weeks later down at Goliad, there had been a, a fight. There was a big tech, about 400 men uh, down there. They, uh, they tried to, to retreat and they got caught and had to surrender. So the, the American army, the Texas army surrenders lock them up for about a week inside of the fort there at Goliad. And then they lined them up in three groups, took them out, and shot them, and massacred, and killed 342 of them. And some did escape, so we know a lot about the story. So that's the Goliad massacre. And then, a little later, Sam Houston brings his army, and they meet at San Jacinto, they meet Santa Ana, San Jacinto. That's the Battle of San Jacinto. It is a massive victory for the Texans. Uh, over 600 Mexicans were killed in that battle, and about that many were captured. Only seven Texans lost their lives uh, at San Jacinto. It's also interesting to note that even during the Battle of the Alamo, the flag that the Americans who were inside the Alamo, the flag that they flew over the Alamo was their Mexican flag. They still wanted to be a part of Mexico under that old constitution. That's what that flag represented. They did not want Santa Ana as their dictator, but they were, anyway, they flew the Mexican flag.
fighting over it. So that's the only time you're ever going to hear me cover any one of those subjects in less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's where we are at the end of the day. Next time, uh, if you want to come back, uh, it's in about a month, we'll finish the story, uh, almost all of it. We'll take you from 1836 and we'll go up to Discovery Bell. We've already got the cattle established, and now we have to get the oil established to make Texas. We'll do that next time. So, questions? <laughs> so, hold on, I hope I Anyway, I hope it worked out right. Anyway, questions now. Let me open up the floor. I probably overwhelmed you with charges. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you for coming.